um, I was born Muslim, alhamdulillah, raised Muslim, but, uh, you know, Muslim by name. I knew very little about my deen, even though my mom and my father, they did do their best, but I knew very little about my deen. Basics, um, eating pig is haram, alcohol is haram, that Muslims pray five times a day, and there's once a month, there's a month called Ramadan, and this was pretty much it. Uh, we grew up in a place where, of course, haram was abundant. Not only was it abundant, but it was actually encouraged. So, alhamdulillah, I mean, you know, for you guys here in South Africa, there's a, there's a strong presence in your communities. So even if someone wants to do something wrong, it's very difficult for the young man or the young woman to sort of openly do something in haram. You'll have to go to certain places. You have to leave your communities. Uh, in the earlier stages for myself growing up, this was not the case. Of course, now things are changing back home in Sydney, alhamdulillah. But, uh, you know, there, there was no such thing as haram or, 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 or you know, or a shameful act. Um, so, of course, yani, you know, grow, growing up, uh, nothing was off limits. Literally nothing was off limits. And it was abundant and it's available. And then, you know, subhanAllah, like you reach a point in your life where you start... You know, you've done everything, you've tasted everything, you've tried everything, you've been everywhere. And there's an emptiness. There's an emptiness, you know. So, and I think this was the beginning of my calling. I always loved Deen. I always loved Islam. It was a thing of respect. But, you know, it was not in my life. So there was no practice, there was no implementation of anything. And uh, actually, subhanAllah, one of my uh, inspirations to coming... Becoming a da'i was actually due to a South African man. No other than the late uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, whom we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon him. Uh -huh. But he played a, a really big influence. I remember the first time I watched a video of his, just the idea that a Muslim could stand on stage with so much confidence and speak about their faith in front of, uh, it was, it really blew me away. So. And then subhanAllah, you know, I, I just, um, I turned to deen, alhamdulillah, and I guess as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> alhamdulillah, no, uh, there is, you know, many youth would be able to identify with your own story, and that inshallah will be an inspiration for them. Inshallah. Now, uh, then progressing in your life and then going out in the path of Allah and uh, becoming more affiliated with deen, uh, how was it for you in terms of, you know, having to leave perhaps those friends and the places where you were going and those that you associated before no regrets whatsoever wallah yani i you know i speak to a lot of brothers and i guess this is hard for them leaving their old for me i uh, uh, for me i loved every minute of it i haven't turned back since i don't regret a single moment i mean if there's any regret i have it's that i didn't do it earlier but having said that not all is bad you know not all is lost i feel that being where I've been helps me in my da'wah today. Now, of course, I'm not saying this so that the young one can be encouraged. <laughs> Let me go have jahiliya and then use this. No, but, you know, I believe for myself personally, it has impacted me. And um, I feel like I understand that side of things more. And it, uh, it helps me addressing those issues in my da'wah. And certainly that does have an impact in a sense that many youth uh, are able to identify with you and they listen to your, you know, your lectures and uh, they draw inspiration. Uh, when we talk about drawing youth towards the Dean of Islam and uh, you know, providing them with content and things that will inspire them, what is, how do we attract them and how do we appeal to them? How honest do you want me to be? As honest as... Uh, you know what is in your heart you say it as it is okay well i believe that we do a lot of injustice towards the youth and the truth is i feel like we contradict ourselves so much because we display one thing but in reality we want another so we say we want the youth we want the youth and everything you do online I and mean, wherever i go organizations big organizations uh, media outlets whatever it is they always display that we do what we do because we want the youth Yet when the youth come to us, we question them, we doubt them, we don't give them roles, we don't give them any positions, right? So it's like we say one thing, but we actually do another. The youth, the Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nusirtu bil Shabab. He says, I was given victory through the youth. 
He loved the youth, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The youth is where the heart is. It's where the passion is. It's where the enthusiasm is. Now, of course, we don't take away anything from our elders and our seniors and our ulama. You know, we pray for them and we need their watchful eye. But the youth, I feel that a lot of the youth have turned away because it's like, you know, I have no role. Like, I'll give you an example. We get a young man who comes onto deen and it's the nature. I know it's difficult, but it's the reality. When someone comes onto deen, especially if he has jahiliya, he comes enthusiastic, he's hungry, he wants deen and he wants it all right now. Now, good or bad, I know we can debate this. I understand. But what do you do with this enthusiasm? There's no role for him. There's nowhere to go. You look at our institutions, you look at our organizations, the same mullah, the same elder that's been there for the last 50 years, he won't give up his seat. And even if he does, it's probably to his son or to his grandson or to his nephew. So what are we doing? We say we want the youth, but then we've got no role for them, do we? Mm. An important point of reflection and, uh, you know, uh, when we talk of truth, it does create the unease, but that is how we will progress by uh, discussing these sensitive issues and then building from that. Uh, when you, you know, you made reference earlier to the difference in uh, the in, uh, the community that you have in South Africa, where there is that signs of Islam, and that is some sort of a protection in Australia. You know, people are more free in a way to say. Uh, how would you describe the typical Muslim community, and what makes Australia different in way in the way people live and uh, you know their approach towards Dean is comparison to South Africa, since it is already your second visit to South Africa. Um. Look, I, I, I think uh, something I definitely want to share, especially with the South African people, and I hope you take this, I'm not being political in any way, rather I'm genuinely being open to you all, that you guys are indebted to the elders of this country. You guys live in a blessing that you will not understand and appreciate until you leave and you see how people outside are living. So, wallahi, my hat off and big, big dua to those elders who came here and worked so hard and establish the community that you guys now enjoy. You know, the, 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 uh, you can see their works, the people that came here and sacrificed their lives. MashaAllah, you guys have a very strong community here. You've got many, many ulama, you've got many schools, hafiz schools, alim schools. Uh, you guys have a very strong presence. Of course, we don't have this back home in Australia. The Muslim community is still relatively young. So it's still new. Um, you know, the. The most senior of our ulama is probably 50 years old. That's the most senior. Whereas you guys have the luxury of the alim, who's the son of a alim, who's the son of a alim, and it was all homegrown people that, you know. So we don't have these things back home. Um, but there's room to grow in Australia. Whereas I feel, and I don't mean this in any bad way, I feel like in South Africa there's no more room to grow like you guys have reached capacity um, and you know something that I see that I was having a chat with the guys before is you've got a lot of these young ulama who go they study they finish their have they finish their alim course nothing to do with them nowhere to go they've got no roles they've got no jobs and when you go back home like say for me in Australia they're dying for anything to do with alim, anyone that can just read salah, someone that can just lead the prayer for us is, is, you know, is a big thing. So subhanAllah, you know, every place and every town has its ups and downs. Uh, the entire South African community have been very touched with the Australian brother who passed away. Also the video that uh, went viral where you spoke about. Uh, the brother. Yes. yes. Perhaps you can you know, share with us uh, uh, any insight on his life story and uh, share with us, uh, you know, your link or anything to him so 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 this brother he's a um, uh, he's a close brother he's from our local masjid and uh, you know subhanAllah what's amazing about his story is he's your typical average everyday Muslim he has a family he has a business um, you know he has his everyday commitments like every single one of us do um, he's 41 years old I mean he died at the age of 41 but a few years ago Subhanallah, some, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what it is that inspired him. I know his younger brother who also came to South Africa and he did his half of the, finished his half of the, um, he inspired him to want to memorize the Quran. Now he had no, no experience with the Quran. His Quran was actually quite poor. But he inspired him and he wanted to memorize the Quran. So I remember 
for years. You know, he would pray Fajr with us in Jama'ah. Then right after Fajr, he would go take his corner and he would sit from Fajr until 9 o'clock in the morning. And then 9 o'clock in the morning, he would take his children to school and then get onto his truck. It's got a lorry here, or is it a truck? Like your tow truck. And then he would go to work. Um, SubhanAllah, and he had this unbelievable dedication. And every single day, you know, and, and he struggled. I remember when a whole week would go by, a whole week, from Fajr until 9 o'clock in the morning, and he would barely memorize one line of the Quran. Subhanallah. But he stayed and he stayed and he was so persistent, subhanAllah, until uh, until uh, um, until he got some flow. And then it was only last year he moved to South Africa. Uh, what's the famous school here? Zakaria. That's, That's the one. That's the one. So he went there um, and he came with his family and he was loving it. He was enjoying it so much. Um, and then the only reason why he ever left was because his mom fell ill. So he came back home to Australia. I think maybe he spent maybe two weeks, three weeks with her. And then she died. And then right after her death, he went straight back. SubhanAllah. So he went straight back. Uh, wallah, if I'm not wrong, maybe a day or two. Wow. Went straight back. He was. He really wanted the Quran so much. He wanted it so badly. And then SubhanAllah, uh, just a few, maybe about a week ago, I was in Umrah. And he was there. And he was there with his brothers, you know, with his siblings and their children and their families. And so I hadn't seen him in, since his mum's death. So in that gap between his mum's death, and I hadn't seen him. But I remember when I seen him in Mecca, Allah, his face was beaming with noor. Beaming with noor. Anyway, so we had a laugh. Obviously, we're very close friends. I said to him, man, what are you doing? You know, how are you looking so good? And, and he said that in his return to South Africa, he fell ill must have had some he was complaining about some lack of iron or some lack of vitamin he had some blood cells or other but it was nothing dramatic there, there was no concern and then subhanallah we i spent with two days with him in mecca he performed his umrah then that night so the next morning i was coming back home to sydney he left mecca and went to medina, medina. And uh, subhanAllah, so I flew out and then I got home, slept that night, woke up in the morning and I got the text message, Inna lillahi wa inna ilaha raji'un, he passed away. So he had got to Medina, spent the day in Medina, prayed Dhuhr in the Rawdah, behind the Imam, because the Imam now prays in the Rawdah. Mm. Uh, so the Imam used to pray in front of the Rawdah, now he prays in the Rawdah. So he had prayed there, prayed directly behind the Imam, he was so excited that he got a chance to pray behind the Imam. Spent about two hours sitting in the Rawdah making dua and afkar and Then he went back home Then he went back to his room He was complaining of some chest pains And uh, his siblings had agreed that they wanted to pray Maghrib in Jama'ah and then they wanted to go eat um, And then it was after Asr his, his chest got really bad Then he asked for an ambulance um, As they asked for the ambulance they took him downstairs into the foyer of the hotel and things got really bad he started making shahada his family didn't you know his family will when they seen him make shahada they they didn't think the situation was as bad as he was reacting you know so they started making dua and they're waiting for the ambulance to come pick him up and his brother he said to me just as they called the adhan for the maghrib salah Allah. he died during the adhan so subhanAllah this was uh, you, know. Yeah. you know subhanAllah I, I, I find it interesting that only in Islam can you be envious of someone's death SubhanAllah. have you noticed this that anyone that really wants Allah when you hear of a noble death a part of you becomes envious Allah. and this is unique to Muslims I think Allahu alam. I've never met a people that envy a good death People always want to live for as long as they possibly can. But for a believer, you know, when you when you feel or you believe that a certain individual has died, and whatever the conditions may be, but you feel that Allah has accepted him, Allah, you become envious of this person's death. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that, you know, um, as I was saying in the video, that the worst thing we can ever do is to say the brother is lucky. Because yes, while there's an element of luck, but when we say that he's lucky, you take away the hard work that he's invested. 
You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do things at random, you know. You work hard, if you really want something and you dedicate and you're sincere, then Allah gives. And I believe this brother, he really wanted it, you know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him. MashaAllah, a really, really touching story and uh, it serves as inspiration for those that are struggling with their hives and for all, every one of us that, you know, we can draw inspiration from uh, the story. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here to our studios, uh, gracing the studios and uh, taking out the time. And uh, we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all your efforts, take you from strength to strength and continue using you as a beacon for the deen mm -hmm. throughout the world, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.